Hey, everybody. This is Bob Goodman, and welcome to another episode of Career Club Live. Uh, this week's episode is sponsored by our newest offering with, that we call Next Placement, which is our innovation in the outplacement category, where we're taking a more people-centric, empathetic approach to caring for the whole person, not just a cell on a spreadsheet who might have found themselves caught up in an organizational restructure. So if your company is looking at any type of a reorg or any type of offboarding of associates, we'd love for you to come take a look at next placement, our disruption in the category of outplacement. Um, this is also being streamed on YouTube. So we would always encourage you to add comments if you'd like, but please like and subscribe so that you don't miss any future episodes. So with that, I would love to introduce our guest today. And I'm going to read this because her credentials are pretty amazing. So uh, today's guest is Julia Pollack. And Julia is the chief economist at ZipRecruiter, which everybody's familiar with, the leading online employment marketplace that uses AI-driven smart matching technology to connect millions of businesses and job seekers. She uses data from the ZipRecruiter marketplace to measure the health of the labor market, identify hiring trends, and help employers and job seekers prepare for the future of work. And we're going to talk a lot about that stuff uh, in our conversation here in a minute. Her research is frequently cited in leading national outlets like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR. She's also contributed to Barron's and a member of the Forbes Human Resources Council. And with that, Julia, welcome. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm really happy to be here. No, it's good. And I'm glad that we can kind of be the capstone on top of all those other media credentials. So way to go. So uh, no, but it, it's great to have you on. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, there's uh, there are lots of distractions here in Las Vegas where I am for a conference, but yes. I ran up through the casino back to my room. To... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you didn't lose any money on the way. I definitely did not. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, as is our want, we love to ask just a couple of icebreaker questions and just help people get to know you a little bit. So we'll start with something really easy. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, stayed there through the end of high school. Took an internship right after, uh, but applied to study in the U.S. Uh, my mother, who was on the board of two universities in, in Cape Town, said that she saw the country moving in the wrong direction, too much political interference in the universities. Uh, and she said she wanted me to sort of aim high and reach for the stars mm -hmm. and apply to Oxford and Harvard and whatever. So I, I, um, I ended up coming to the United States to study at Harvard and fell in love with the country and stayed. Well, awesome. Like you anticipated our second question, which is very good <laughs> school. So well done. Um, did I see on your, your background that you also have an advanced degree? Yes. So uh, after after uh, my undergrad in economics at Harvard, I went to the Party Rand Graduate School's doctoral program uh, in policy analysis, which is basically like an applied economics degree mm -hmm. uh, where we also did client work, um, uh, policy analysis work for major clients ranging from uh, the you know health and, and human services departments to uh, the defense department uh, and to private sector businesses. Oh, very cool. And so maybe that's kind of the lead into the next question, which is, do you mind just sort of briefly painting a little bit of a picture of your career arc uh, after yeah. school? Sure. So I started off interested in economics and uh, and labor issues, primarily coming from South Africa, which had you know a plus 30 percent unemployment rate always. And it was just a, wow. a very salient human tragedy as you travel through the country. Uh, then at RAND, um, oh, well, Actually, right after college, my first job was actually as a policy research assistant for national security policy. Uh, I applied for the uh, economic uh, uh, research assistant role and for the national sort of defense one um, and ended up getting the defense one. And the defense policy role was, was also really interesting to me because I think you know, I, I came to the United States um, uh, at a time when uh, the Iraq war and Afghanistan war were, were oh, sort yeah. of the major issues. Um, and, uh, and I spent a lot of time studying military uh, issues. But what I found studying defense was that uh, I think like, like most issues, they end up coming back to uh, manpower issues, to recruitment and retention. Uh, you know, an army very much marches on its stomach. Um, and before you get to uh, strategy and policy, you really have to work on uh, training, recruitment, retention, et cetera. And so at RAND, I ended up moving back into manpower and, and labor related topics. Uh, I taught pep um, economics at Pepperdine after that uh, for, for about a year and a half um, before one day 
uh, I, I wasn't looking for a job. I was actually quite happy raising my young kids and teaching as an adjunct um, while also doing some policy work at RAND. But I heard a ZipRecruiter ad on the radio and uh, I ended up um, uh, going on and just exploring, you know, discovering what jobs lay out there for economists. And there had just been a job posted for an economist at ZipRecruiter, you know, on oh ZipRecruiter. Um, and their office happened to be a uh, six block walk from my home. So there was, you know, wow. they couldn't have been a more convenient role. And I, and I applied for that. That sounds like a match made in heaven. Now you anticipate the next question. Tell me just a little bit about your family. Sure. So, uh, so I have three kids, um, an 11 year old girl, a seven year old boy and an almost two year old girl. Mm. Um, my daughter is extremely musical and there's nothing more exciting than watching her just shred it on the guitar. <laughs> um, my son wow. is uh, a baseball fanatic and, um, and, you know, I'm, I've turned into the parents I made fun of in the stands, we you know, all do. jumping up and down <laughs> and rooting like a maniac. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so yeah, we have we we live in sunny Los Angeles near near the ocean, and uh, wouldn't want to be anywhere else. We, no, we that sounds awesome. So so again, you're doing such a good job of just sort of leading me down the path. So when you're not doing uh, wonky chief economist ZipRecruiter stuff, what do you, what do you guys do for fun? I, I assume it's got a lot of kid orientation to it. Definitely uh, going to the beach, hikes. We live in a neighborhood with amazing hiking trails, um, playing music with the kids. So lots of jam sessions on guitars, violins. Uh, I play the cello and piano. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm the nerdy parent who does all the classical music stuff with the kids. My husband is the cool parent who uh, takes out the guitar and the bass and, and uh, you know, the amplifiers and rocks out with them. Um, uh, and then my absolute favorite activity in the whole world is reading children's books to my kids. I read to them all day, every day, basically, when I'm not at work. Uh, and uh, I think there's just nothing better than Roald Dahl and Astrid Lindgren. And, you know, I, I can read and reread those all day long. Awesome. Awesome. OK, that was fun. I, I learned a lot and that, that was very cool. So um, let's kind of get into the meat of the conversation. Just sort of broadly, can you describe for folks what your role is exactly? What, what does the chief economist at ZipRecruiter do? Sure. I mean, so I have two main responsibilities. One uh, is to uh, explore ZipRecruiter data and, and see what it says about labor market trends. You know, a lot of the, the national data that we get is mixed. Some of it is delayed. Uh, and so uh, and it's also it's also very high level. Right. There's no such thing as the labor market. There are uh, millions of little labor markets that can be very, very, very different in terms of uh, the number of employers, the number of candidates, uh, the skill and quality of the candidates. Uh, it's et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. um, I look at occupations and locations around the country and see where there are mismatches between what employers want and what job seekers want, and then ways that our product can help bring them together. That's our real goal is to connect uh, job seekers and employers quickly um, and, and make them all better off. Uh, so one job is to digest our data and uh, find ways that job seekers and employers can succeed in the marketplace and communicate those insights through the media, through our own reports. Um, and then the other is to develop uh, actionable insights reports for uh, mainly enterprise customers. And, and one day we hope to you know, roll those out to everybody as well. Oh, that's very, very fun. I mean, it doesn't sound like you have a shortage of things to be focused on and this no. continue to clip <laughs> along. You know, it's, it's very dynamic. Uh, it's very dynamic. The labor market keeps changing. And of course, the last three years have been more dynamic, more volatile, more crazy and unpredictable than ever before. So this may not be a, a current, uh, a totally fair way of framing this out. So if, if this doesn't work for you, you can correct this. But if you could sort of for listeners, because our audience will be a lot of HR professionals, business mm -hmm. owners, as well as the candidate, the, the talent side of the equation. So could you set the stage of just sort of where the current labor market is based on the data that you guys are looking at? And I'm thinking about things like Fed policy, inflation, uh, you know, unemployment rates, you know, job openings that aren't being filled. And there, I'm sure there's a million other attributes how you might frame it up, but those are maybe four that pop in my head. Sure. I mean, so, you know, we, we had this unprecedented uh, recession in 2020 where companies did something many of them have never, ever done before. I mean, you talk to major hospitality groups and they laid off 
all 20,000 staff uh, mm. overnight in March, right? Then over the course of 2021 and 2022, they had to hire them all back because business resumed much more quickly than they'd anticipated. And now you have a strange moment in the labor market where uh, businesses like restaurants and hotels and airlines are continuing to do a roaring trade and are continuing to recover and restaff and hire like mad and are continuing to experience sort of acute labor shortages. But other parts of, of the economy where companies expanded headcount, you know, sometimes 50 percent, uh, like in tech, uh, in many warehousing companies, in mortgage yeah. lending companies, uh, those companies expanded because of a once in a lifetime unsustainable set of factors, you know, zero interest rates, uh, every American wanting to sort of start becoming a retail stock trader, everyone wanting to refinance their home all at once, everyone being stuck on their computers and their phones uh, with nothing else to do. And, um, and there you're seeing a pullback and uh, um, sort of uh, a, a total change in 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 conditions, uh, mean reversion, whiplash, <laughs> whatever yes. you want to call it. Um, so it's a it's a very strange market right now, where I think all the signs are mixed because uh, the experience is very different depending on where you stand. Well, I think you make such a great point around there is not a labor market. There are different fragments of it that have their own unique qualities with it. Now, having said that. You know, one of the things that, that I'd love to hear you talk about is employer sentiment. And, you know, in some cases, it, it would seem that, you know, particularly like with tech companies, whether they're really big ones or ones that were awash in cash because VC money was, you know, the most that had ever been deployed. Um, and then that just completely turned off. Right. But then you've got other CEOs that are looking at, you know, uh, you on CNBC and other people are going like, hey, I don't want to be like losing in, you know, um, uh, the last chair, you know, and like, hey, I was the only one that didn't like cut staff because, you know, I failed to anticipate the recession and things were going to get tougher. And now I, I'm losing in musical chairs. What's sort of your feeling on employer sentiment? And again, if there's multiple flavors of that, identify them. Right. So I think it's it's very mixed at the moment. There are companies, especially in sort of business to business services, uh, companies related to tech that are seeing a, a steep pullback in advertising spend, uh, in subscriptions, et cetera, and, yeah. uh, and that are feeling nervous, that are cautious, that are uh, trying to uh, go from offering growth for years and years to offering profitability, yes. um, uh, that, are, that are sort of following Mark Zuckerberg's uh, year of efficiency march. Uh, and then there are others that don't know what everyone's talking about, <laughs> that see just blockbuster record-breaking numbers, sales you know, continuing to go through the roof, uh, huge numbers of summer bookings, for example, for, yeah. for vacations. Um, and they see no sign of recession in their books at all. And yet, they they read the news, right? they watch the headlines, exactly. they turn on the TV, and they are very concerned. They don't want to overexpand headed into a downturn. They don't want to be foolish. And so I think those employers would be hiring much more right now were it not for the fact that the Fed had raised interest rates um, and, and were it not for the fact that the Fed were, was communicating that they may continue to do so for goodness knows how long. Um, so that profound degree of business uncertainty is causing businesses to uh, take a wait and see approach, to pause major investments, to hold off on opening a second location, to hold off on taking a loan to get a massive piece of new equipment. And that means they're not hiring for that new equipment and that new location either. Um, I think the minute uh, we're confident that inflation has come down, the minute the Fed uh, hits the pause button, those employers will finally uh, feel confident again, yeah. and you'll see uh, sort of this pent up demand for talent uh, unleashed in, in the market. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I pray that you're right. And I, because some of this is uh, self-inflicted is right, but it seems to be under our control. Right. And, and so right. when the Fed kind of finishes what they're going to do on monetary policy and people go, OK, now I know what the next X months, you know, a few quarters mm -hmm. likely looks like. Now I can make a decision with more confidence. Yes. And, and deploy capital in, in different areas with, with a bit exactly. more confidence. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, geographically, 
Mm -hmm. Size of company, so some of the ways that you might slice the data. Hospitality is an easy one, uh, and you kind of talked about that. Right. I, you know. What are some other sectors that, that feel either more like they're going to be the beneficiaries of this, or they might mm -hmm. are suffering a little bit more while we're in this uncertainty? Well, you know, all of the industries I think that uh, that are still down in terms of overall employment, uh, where, where employment levels are below what they were before the pandemic, uh, still have a lot of, of recovering and catching up to do. The government is finally uh, adding lots of, of uh, people to payrolls now in mm -hmm. schools and in government departments. Uh, they, of course, were sort of flat footed, caught flat footed in 2021 and 2022 when the private sector was much more flexible and nimble, was much more able to offer remote work to offer individuals specific yeah. negotiated bonuses. Um, they weren't bound by collective bargaining agreements to the same degree or by pay scales or you know by those kinds of constraints. And, um, and so they could surge ahead and recover more quickly. But finally, now with labor force participation continuing to recover uh, and with some private sector players pulling back, we are seeing, uh, you know, the government recover, um, you know, public sector hiring pick up. Uh, we're also um, seeing nursing homes and child daycare services yeah. and, and all of those struggling sort of laggards in the post-COVID recovery finally start to make some gains. Um, but, you know, we're continuing to see strong numbers in, in leisure and hospitality, in tourism um, and in personal care services. So there, there are there are lots of areas uh, of, of sort of growth and uh, yeah. uh, with, with, there are lots of bright spots in the economy right now. So, so, and maybe this is um, a little bit of a head fake here, but but you know layoffs are in the news. We've talked about that here mm -hmm. just a little bit, right? And tech clearly you know has uh, underwritten a lot of the layoff uh, news, but but your data I think suggests that maybe this isn't quite as prevalent. As you know, the thirty, you know, the big point, you know, bold headlines of like, like you would think that everybody's laying off tons of employees. Does the data support that? So we don't capture data on layoffs. We capture data on you know hiring and job postings. And um, but if you look at overall national data, what you see is that the main reason that job growth has declined is because of a decline in hiring and, and job postings uh, more than due to an uptick in layoffs. So layoffs in the Bureau of Labor Statistics is data uh, in jobless claims are still pretty low. They have ticked up in recent months, particularly in uh, information. So, and in financial services, there are some places where layoffs now are above uh, their pre-COVID average levels. Uh, but overall, in most of the economy, uh, layoffs are still vanishingly rare. And you know, the um, the lowest number of, of layoffs and discharges, layoffs and firings that ever took place in a month uh, in 20 years of data collected by the Labor Department uh, was 1.6 million before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And after the pandemic in 2021, 2022, we routinely had month upon month upon month of only 1.3 to 1.4 million layoffs taking place. Mm -hmm. um, so extremely unusually low numbers. And when you talk to real companies, what they say that meant was that they weren't firing people even for cause. They they had changed their standards and rules uh, from a uh, sort of one strike you're out policy if you show up late for work or show up drunk to a 10 strikes you're out policy uh, because they were just so terrified of having to replace people and it was so expensive to do so. Well, okay, so so thank you. That's a, that's a great transition point on retention. And, and I know that you speak about this some, but you know, what do you advise your employer? You talk about your enterprise clients. What's ZipRecruiter's advice to employers from a retention strategy perspective? What are maybe three things that the company should be doing? Well, the first thing I do is to point out the, the data, which is that uh, layoffs are still, so uh, employee quits are still very, very elevated. They're still 
uh, way above average and a much larger share of all turnover than they were before uh, when when employers called more of the shots and decided when people stay, you know, went and when they stayed. Um, so that's that's the backdrop. The backdrop is, um, you know, you're you're losing the people that you most want and you're only able to retain uh, uh, people who in other circumstances would be fired. And this is a, you know, a very, very tricky situation. And it's showing up in the data uh, in terms of a decline in customer experience and uh, um, customer satisfaction surveys uh, mm -hmm. across the economy. Uh, so this is having a real business impact. Um, what are some ways to recruit and retain workers? Well, one thing we find in our surveys is that workers are all different. And so we can't give one size fits all mm -hmm. solutions to anybody. Uh, the most important thing you can do really is a survey your workers, find out which benefits and perks are most valuable to them uh, and, and, you know, optimize your offerings for the workers that you, uh, that you have, that you most want to retain and the workers you most want to attract. Do, do you see any of that? And if you guys don't have the data, that's cool. But do, do you have any visibility into how that might vary generationally? So absolutely. Yes. So we, we run a quarterly job seeker confidence index survey where we ask job seekers lots of questions about what they're interested in. And uh, there, there's very wide uh, variation uh, across uh, generations. Um, uh, you know, older workers, uh, of course, tend to care much more about retirement benefits and health insurance. Uh, young workers often, uh, you know, or, or sort of workers in the middle, um, uh, you see a sort of surprisingly large effect of uh, fertility benefits and pet insurance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, younger workers like earned wage access. Uh, they don't like uh, overdraft uh, charges. They're living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. So uh, companies understanding what the main pain points are, the sort of challenges of daily life that their employees face are, and finding ways to, to use their size in the market, their ability to negotiate you know, favorable rates and provide access to sort of tools and platforms, um, if they can, if they can sort of leverage that uh, size and might, they can often offer employees things that are tremendously valuable to them that are not that costly to the employer. It's funny, I, I think it was just this week I was reading an article about um, basically uh, kind of the flip side of tuition reimbursement, which is student loan repayment and actually providing a stipend specifically for that purpose. To help people that are, you know, struggling under eighty thousand dollars or whatever of student loan debt, and the company, you know, basically helping them, you know, and it's such a big source of stress. Like right. Is, is that something you've seen? Absolutely. So, so student loans are hugely salient. We just did a uh, a survey of um, of the, this year's graduating class of the class of twenty twenty three. Uh, the majority of those students are graduating with student loans, and they are worried about uh, about making those payments. Uh, and they're planning to to change their lives uh, and their their job search priorities yeah. uh, to deal with it. So, there are a number of ways that employers can help. One is just to offer uh, a sort of planning tool, a way to immediately send part of your paycheck to cover oh, mm -hmm. your student loans, um, uh, you know, with with no match from the employer, with no, you know, no uh, water off the, the employer's back at all. Yeah. Um, the other way is to offer some kind of match. So it's like a 401k match mm -hmm. uh, where the employee pays in and, and you uh, offer them something in, in addition. Um, and then there are other kinds of ways to do it with, you know, outright uh, sort of checks with, um, with uh, student loan assistance checks. So there, there are lots and lots of ways to do all of these things. And, uh, and sometimes it requires sort of a little bit of testing to see what your employees really value and, and what's enough, right? Yes. Of course, this is an environment where, where companies want to be uh, prudent um, stewards of investor money um, and, uh, and and feel as though in many cases they've done as much as they can, right? There were these huge wage increases during the pandemic, yeah. many out of cycle wage increases. Um, businesses are feeling as though they're, they're stretched to the max at this point. And so now's the time to be creative uh, and, and see you know, where the sweet spot is. Well, you know, and, and kind of to your point, you don't have to spend a lot of money on this because it's actually such an emotional issue. It's the fact exactly. that you're trying. Exactly. 
with this that I feel like I have an ally and somebody who's on my team trying to help me deal with this. Right. And, you know, student loans are so annoying. Most people have student loans from multiple different providers. You don't know where to log in, how to pay, how much you owe. Often there are multiple payments throughout the month mm -hmm. to different providers. So if you just offer a tool that helps them consolidate that loan and have one loan that comes right yeah. out of their paycheck, so they never even, they can set it and forget it. Um, those are the kinds of, of uh, forms of assistance that don't need to cost very much at all. Um, yeah, yeah, som yeah. Sometimes they even charge a fee to the employee rather than to the employer. The employer just facilitates this. Uh, earned wage access is another one. Uh, employees, uh, you know, most Americans uh, lose so much money in overdraft charges to their banks uh, if they can get access to their pay when they need it. It's better for everyone. Um, what what many companies discovered, what, which was a surprising benefit of providing so this daily pay type uh, perk, was that when employees were short 20 bucks for gasoline, they, uh, in the past, would call out sick and then drive for Uber or Lyft uh, to get cash more quickly. Oh, wow. And so they would moonlight. Um, and, uh, and if instead you're giving workers access to their earned wages, uh, you know, right away when they need it, um, you, you improve, uh, um, you, you reduce absenteeism, you raise morale, uh, you reduce sort of petty cash theft and the kinds of behaviors That's that you really don't want, uh, people, people doing and, you know, and you help them by, by avoiding that temptation. So, um, there, I think there were lots and lots and lots of win, win, wins that are not yet um, uh, that ubiquitous. Uh, there's still quite a lot of low hanging fruit. And the most important low hanging fruit of all is the real basics, like pleasant, ergonomically um, sound workspaces, mm. well lit workspaces, climate control, um, uh, break rooms with water fountains, with coffee, uh, simple things, simple things. Well, okay, so maybe just real briefly, if we can touch on this, just sort of the whole remote versus return to office phenomenon. And we've seen, obviously, you know, some pretty high profile CEOs, like get your butt back in the office, like the vacation's over, I need you, I need you back in the office. And employees going, yeah, no, like, I really don't want to go to your office. I actually like not having three hours of my life chewed up in a commute. I actually like having dinner with my kids, you know, and, and things like that. Are you guys seeing um, any decrease in remote only or remote first types of openings? So we divide the labor market into sort of four segments. Uh, one where remote work has just continued to rise and you're not seeing any pullback. And that's in tech, law, healthcare, uh, a number of, of key industries. Uh, there's another segment of industries where remote work sort of rose a bit and then just kind of plateaued, um, where there aren't really that many roles that can be done remotely. There's another segment where remote work was rapidly adopted, but as an emergency measure only, it didn't work well, like in K through 12, schools yeah. and it very rapidly went away again because it just is terrible. Uh, and then there's a whole enormous part of the US labor force where there was no penetration of remote work at all because the jobs just have to be done in person, yeah. passenger transport, uh, food preparation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're, no, we're seeing a shift in the industry mix of jobs right now where the, more than 70% of the jobs being added each month are in uh, leisure and hospitality, um, the government, um, uh, and, uh, and healthcare in these very in-person industries. And so the remote share of postings overall has gone down, but not actually because of what you're seeing in the headlines about um, tech CEOs demanding people come back to work. Uh, on the contrary, um, office vacancy rates keep to keep going up, not down, uh, mm -hmm. as you know, one by one companies come to the end of their leases and say, we're out where, you know, there are only two people in this office that accommodates 2000, you know, we're, we're downsizing, we're moving from two floors to one, et cetera, et cetera. Well, so as is so common in the data, right? Like you, you have to start peeling it back and there's not mm -hmm. this sort of monolithic one size fits all answer. It's a bit more nuanced than that. And I really appreciate your explanation. There's a few things there that like that was new to me. So I, I love how you guys have kind of not quartile, but you've, you've partitioned <laughs> it into, into four different uh, segments and they have their own behaviors.
associated with them. So that's cool. Um, see, one of the things that, so Career Club's business is, you know, helping folks in, in career transitions. So that could be mm -hmm. an individual job seeker who's in between opportunities. That could be somebody who's currently working, but in my crass way of saying it, Sunday night sucks and they're looking for something. <laughs> And then there's kind of the B2B side of it, which is outplacement, what we talked about right. with next placement. So we talk a lot with candidates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know if we have a bias pool of folks or what, but candidate experience seems to be pretty not great. And, you know, whether it's, you know, the kind of, I applied online, never heard anything back because the ATS mm -hmm. opted me out. Or I did have some initial screening and then I got ghosted, as everybody says. Or, you know, it felt like almost like a perfunctory job posting. And yeah, I went through some of the interview process, but they ended up going with an internal candidate. Um, th those would be some common themes that we mm -hmm. hear from, from our folks. I'm curious from your side, you know, how you see candidate experience and, and are we seeing anything that's representative of the market or is that maybe not necessarily? So I think a lot of these problems come down to the time dimension and how difficult that actually makes this whole matching problem. So in very organized, limited, bounded labor markets, like say the labor market for graduating law students, mm -hmm. uh, there are institutions that run the labor market. And there's a set day when everyone needs to apply. And there's a set day when all employers need to have gotten back to all the candidates. And then there's a, you know, a set onboarding period where everyone goes through onboarding at once. There, you can really uh, you know, rank all of the candidates, see everyone who's out there, respond to everyone when they expect you to respond to them, and then have you know, a whole cohort sort of forged together in this group experience. Instead, of course, in the broader labor market, like the ZipRecruiter marketplace, there is no real central planner and companies are hiring all the time. Candidates are applying all the time. Um, they're, they're sending so many applications. Employers are looking at so many candidates. Half the time when, it, when an employer likes a candidate and uh, sort of reaches out with an offer, they've already been snapped up by somebody else. Uh, when the candidate you know, really likes a company, it's too late, their applicant number 237, and even if they would have been the best candidate, the employer's not even looking at that resume anymore. Right? Employers um, mostly only look at the resumes that are received in the first and second weeks of within, you know, within the job posting. Um, uh, so time is a really crucial dimension here. It makes things very, very tricky. It means that um, companies don't know how to get everyone together for group onboarding because you have one person starting in January, two people starting in March, seven people. You know, It's just actually a very, very, very complicated problem. I think it's something that we at ZipRecruiter are, are actively working to solve. We're trying to sort of create the um, uh, sort of digital version of you know a hiring of an in-person hiring event mm -hmm. where all of the recruiters are lined up sitting there and the candidates um, are are in a line and, and they're sort of speed dating and today's the day everyone's going to hear uh, your back and uh, so I, I think to the extent that we can create that experience uh, everyone will be better off um, bringing people together at point in time who are both available and interested um, and who can make contact immediately and see each other immediately, I think would, would make a world of difference. Maybe this is a good opportunity then because part of that is process, part of that's technology, and I'm sure there's mm -hmm. a lot of other elements. But um, you know, I originally discovered you um, in the Wall Street Journal, and I think you were at a conference and the, they were talking about AI. Mm -hmm. and so how do you see AI you know, both from the employer's perspective and in this process that we we're just talking about, and then also from the candidate side. Well, this is a very exciting moment. You know, anytime you have a breakthrough new technology like this, um, neither the uh, designers of that technology, nor the first adopters, nor big businesses really know what its potential is going to yeah. be, uh, how quickly people are going to adopt it, how they're going to like it. Um, 
you know, every day you see new threads on Twitter uh, of people showing off something they discovered that they could do with ChatGPT yes. uh, or, or various AI tools. I mean, it's just there are hundreds of AI tools being released now every day uh, that, that you know use this underlying technology as their their basis. Um, I saw someone uh, posting about how she spent seventeen dollars on some tool um, that allowed her to just take a, a selfie, you know, looking like she does in the morning, you know, no makeup. Uh, and turn it into a beautiful corporate headshot. Oh. Um, uh, you know, there, there, I think there are, there are so many ways that it can be used in our space mm -hmm. um, by job seekers and employers to help them both stand out and be the best they can be. And it's, it's ordinary individuals who are discovering those uh, every day. Uh, employers are increasingly looking for those kinds of individuals. The people who love, who, who see a new technology and go, yeah, and immediately log on, get a subscription and fiddle with it and figure out uh, everything they can do with it, right? Stretch it until it breaks. Um, though employers are, are looking for those people now very eagerly uh, to help them figure out how they can incorporate it in their product and how they can get ahead of the game. Yeah. So you know, we we've we've had some good success with our clients, and again, everybody's sort of like we're fiddling with it right now. And we're all just sort of you know kind of you know trying to figure it out heuristically, but. Um, you know, doing things like, um, you know, downloading um, content from the company and saying, like, you know, give me five really good questions to ask mm -hmm. during an interview. Right. Um, or, you know, part of our methodology is encouraging people to be very proactive in reaching out to companies and finding mm -hmm. the decision maker. And, well, I could spend hours and hours and hours scouring every website and whatever, or I could use technology for what it's good for, and at Absolutely. least I'm kind of doing that early discovery and kind of you know, start to compartmentalize this a little bit for me and create some kind of a narrative here that I can start to work off of. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're finding that it's giving candidates like a huge jumpstart of being a differentiated candidate Absolutely. and not Absolutely. being candidate number 247, you yeah. know, in line on the ATS, but actually doing something different than what everybody else is doing, and, and you know, hopefully working a little bit smarter and using technology again for what it's good for. Absolutely, I think I think this technology is going to separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to candidates uh, to, to an enormous degree. Uh, the most sophisticated candidates are going to uh, sort of treat chat GPT like a parent or friend uh, saying, you know, how, how do I look at my resume, cr you know, critique it, how do I make it stand out? How can I improve this? What are some skills missing on this resume that yes. would be valuable for me to get if I want these kinds of roles? Um, uh, you know, be the worst hiring manager you could possibly be. Uh, pretend that you're a total jerk and you want me to fail and you want to embarrass me and ask the kinds of, um, of interview questions that give me sort of a deer in the headlights look. You know, put me on the spot. Ask me something really hard. Um, help me turn my resume into an elevator pitch, a 30 second response yes. to the question I'm inevitably going to get, which is tell me about yourself. Right? That always seems to floor candidates. Somehow uh, either they ramble on for 30 minutes about their background and you know, in, chrono you know, in chronological order yes. and tell us everything they've done in their lives. Um, uh, or they just stare blankly and say, well, what do you want to know? Or, you know? know. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I think if you use this tool well, you can really stand out and just hit it out of the park and be confident and comfortable and shine. There, this is maybe a little bit of a non sequitur, but I think it is related, which is around older candidates mm -hmm. and perceived ageism. And I think a lot of um, perceived rejection gets laid at the, the foot of ageism. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things we find is like, no, it's irrelevance in some cases. Like, like tell me about your experience with ChatGPT. Well, I haven't really been on it. I don't know. Well, okay, so you're you're opting yourself out. That's not ageism. You know, in my view, that's your relevance. And mm -hmm. yeah, we find other folks who, as you say, just sort of like run to it. They're like, this is cool. Let me play with it. Let me break it, you know, <laughs> and, and see what I can do with it. Right. And those are the candidates, surprisingly, that we see are having a lot of success in their job search because mm -hmm. they're staying current with what's going on. 
Right. And some of them are older. You know, when, when there are, I think there is a, a bias against older workers, but there are ways to sort of disarm that bias and, uh, and, and counteract it. And one is to show how tech savvy you are exactly. throughout the process, uh, to put it right there on your, your resume that you are, um, you know, enthusiastic about new technologies or uh, showcase your proficiency with chat GPT some way. Definitely well, one way to do it. So, super, so that kind of makes me think about talent pools more broadly. And you know, in some of the other uh, podcasts that we've had with thought leaders like you, one of the topics that comes up pretty regularly is broadening the talent pool. So we might talk about people with prior convictions, mm -hmm. as an example, people who do not have a four-year degree. Maybe they've been to a tech boot camp or something like that, or older workers, somebody who's unretiring for whatever right. reason. They're bored, they need the money, something. Um, mm -hmm. Where does that fit into how you guys, and maybe you specifically think about changes that could be made in this very competitive talent market? So historically, something you see uh, is that uh, labor force participation just kind of keeps rising as um, you chug along uh, through an economic expansion. So until you hit another recession, uh, people are going to just keep on coming in off the sidelines. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, many economists thought we had already reached maximum employment, that uh, la labor force participation among women was going to, uh, you know, ha had plateaued for years and was going to fall. Instead, it kept rising. Uh, and so, you know, ideally, um, uh, we we would avoid recessions forevermore and we would keep drawing people in. One of the reasons that happens is because there seems to be some kind of sort of speed limit in how quickly the labor for the labor market can absorb talent and candidates. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, you know, we sort of suck up all the people who are most available, who are actively seeking work. And yeah. then, uh, you know, once once you sort of exhaust the supply of, of, of the, you know, the, the most salient, most active job seekers, you end up you know, drawing in um, a pretty steady stream of people from other places. Um, that said, of course, there are other ways to. Uh, to help employers find uh, those candidates, to help those candidates find uh, the, you know the kinds of jobs that they most like. I mean, you know, we've we've encouraged uh, employers to uh, highlight that they are veteran friendly yes. or that they are um, uh, you know friendly to, to past offenders or whatever it is. And there there are ways for employers to stand out. Uh, they can sign the ARP's pledge and be listed uh, on on job boards that specifically appeal to older workers. There are many, many, many ways to to go about it and to um, to yeah to expand your talent pools and reach reach new uh, audiences. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, we've covered a ton of of topics, and, and this has been fascinating. But one of the things that I also really always like to ask our guests, and I think that from some of the things that you've shared with us, between being an immigrant to the U.S., a woman, a working mom. What's career advice that you would give to you know, maybe a younger Julia and, and somebody who might be listening? Or in my case, I've got a daughter who I think you know, would uh, be a peer of yours in so many ways. Um, what career advice did you give uh, younger women and working moms? Ah, um, so I think the, the, you know, the number one piece of advice I would give is to think carefully about what your ideal role uh, would be uh, by looking at other people. You know, I think for a long time, Condoleezza Rice was sort of the, the person whose career sort of spanning acad academia, uh, policy making uh, was, was sort of the, the kind of gold standard for what I was going for. Um, so see if you can craft the ideal uh, career or role for yourself and then make it happen. Um, I decided before I applied to ZipRecruiter, before I even knew about this job, that I wanted to be uh, a labor economist at TaskRabbit, at some kind yes. of, of company that connects employers and job seekers in real time where I could, uh, using real data that 
looks at uh, people's reviews, at whether they have a picture included or not, at how many jobs they've done, you know, what differences those made in, in hiring and retention and recruitment and performance. Um, and so I started finding contacts uh, at the company and I was going to reach out to people and pitch them that there could be PR value and thought leadership value in having an economist explore their data more. And then I happened to just you know, browse ZipRecruiter one day and I found there was exactly that job already listed at a company. But once you first step back and think about what it is you want, it's easier to find it, to, you know, to spot it when you see it. Um, sometimes it doesn't exist. And then I would encourage people to, to uh, to go and create it themselves, to pick up the phone, to send emails, to uh, to you know slide into people's DMs on Twitter, to yep. reach them on LinkedIn, etc. Well, I, I so so yes, the, the the thing about like know what you're looking for. So sometimes in tell me about yourself or Julie, what are you looking for? You know, that's really a good question. Like you know, I'm not really sure. Well, that's not a great answer. Sometimes. Well, about half of people on ZipRecruiter who are looking for jobs uh, left the search bar blank when it came to uh, the, the job title they were looking for. Uh, they would do a blank search and just kind of let the product guide them. We now have Phil, our AI uh, personal recruiter, ask candidates, do you know what you want or not? Are you exploring? Do you want, do you want me to help you sort of discover different roles? Yes. Um, and so the product is now trying to hold people's hands a little bit and give them a sort of tour through the labor market because there is a dizzying array of jobs out there. No one uh, knows all of the possibilities out there. Um, and jobs are becoming more and more specialized. There are an increasing number of, of job titles, of skills listed in job postings yes. uh, all the time. So you can't possibly know everything that's out there. Uh, and, and, um, and you know, it really helps to have a guide through the process. Well, I think we just added a new resource for us being Phil because... <laughs> No, I'm being serious because the discovery piece of this is really important. It's very important. And, and it's very foundational to the work mm -hmm. that we do with our members is that you, you need to sometimes slow down to hurry up yes. and, and do some of this discovery work and figure out. And, and you did like you knew fairly specifically, I think, mm -hmm. the kind of role that was going to be exciting to you. The second piece of what I heard you say that, again, would really resonate with with our methodology is now go find people who can help you, who can give you more information, who might be able to help you network to the kind of role that you're doing. And then the, go ahead. Yeah, although something I have to say, I'm uh, sort of, that gave me huge confidence in, in the world was that uh, in each of the roles that I've uh, had, especially my, my yeah, all of my jobs, um, there, there was no connection. There was no network. There, were, I didn't know anyone. I applied cold to everything, mm -hmm. uh, and so also, ha you know, I think it is important to have some faith in the process. You don't necessarily uh, need an in. Uh, you know, sometimes you you should just throw your hat in the ring and uh, and trust that there are still companies that uh, you know that eat their own dog food, that yes. post jobs and really mean it, that are that are doing a um, an open search uh, and that are uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a fair yeah. point. And and to that point, that's why we encourage our, our clients to take what I would call an omni channel approach, mm -hmm. right? It's apply online, work with recruiters, you right. know, do networking, do direct outreach to companies that are of interest to you, like do all of it right? because you don't know which one's going to hit. Something will hit. You just don't know which one and when. So you have to have kind of a, a diversified strategy. Right? Absolutely. And, and use uh, outbound sort of proactive recruiting as well. Reach out to passive talent. Uh, yes. There are many people who kind of just continue moving along with their life the way it is. They may be bored, they may feel like they're underpaid, but there's just so much to do when you get home, you know, uh, bathing the kids, giving them dinner, sending them to bed. You can't, you know, you don't have time to, to fix the problem and do serious rethinking, um, but reaching out to candidates and saying, hey, you're a great fit, uh, often has a fantastic approach. It's, it's the piece of the experience on ZipRecruiter uh, that, that de delivers the best experience for job seekers and employers consistently. I think you might have a statistic behind that. How is that kind of, I, I think I saw something that you were, were quoted on. How do you see that, that methodology kind of taking root with, with, uh, in your numbers? 
Yeah, so people who are invited to apply uh, are, are, you know, are twice as likely to uh, to do so as people who just sort of passively saw the, the job uh, in, in their feed. Uh, and they are about three times as likely to get a thumbs up from the employer. So you know, when an employer has already seen you and decided that you're a great fit for their job and then you apply, um, you know, Everyone is is excited and happy, and it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing. Uh, candidates love the feeling of being told, "Hey, we value you." You know, we yes. it's like Uncle Sam needs you. You know, like the <laughs> the army recruiting campaign. Um, it's a very compelling message. Well, and then you know, around culture, and am I going to feel at home here? And just feel like a, this place is a good fit for me. They're inviting me. They're like telling me, hey, we value you. You have experience and qualities that we find very valuable. It also and, signals that you are actually hiring. I, many, many candidates are worried when they see a job posting that it's, yeah. you know, not worth their effort and time to make a big investment. And they're a little shy and nervous. Should I put myself out there for people yeah. who will just reject me? Uh, so when you show that you really are actively hiring and looking for exactly what they offer, uh, that, that's a very important signal. That's an optimistic note to end on. Julia, this has been awesome. I have learned a ton. It's been great to get to know you here a little bit. Um, and for listeners, again, you know, please make sure that you're following Career Club on LinkedIn. Uh, we'd love for you to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use and or on YouTube. Uh, but anyway, Julia, this has been phenomenal. I hope you have a Thank great you, conference there in Vegas. And I look forward to speaking with you soon. Thanks so much. And I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank too. you so much. Bye. I know you.